Good day. My name is Gabor Mate. I'm a medical doctor in Vancouver and the author of several books, including my first, which was on attention deficit disorder, the subject of my talk today. Now, ADD is a condition that's uh, a poorly understood, underappreciated, sometimes overdiagnosed, and sometimes overtreated. But overall, it's burgeoning. According to American figures, 10% of American children now meet the diagnostic criteria for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, much more than before. Uh, I don't know about Canadian statistics, but we do know that in Canada, uh, 10 times as many kids are getting Ritalin as we were getting them maybe 15 years or so ago. Again, in the US, uh, according to a recent report in the New York Times, over 400,000 children, including over 200,000 age 12 or under, are receiving heavy-duty antipsychotic medications, in other words, medications such as we give to adults, schizophrenics, to control their psychosis. In the case of children, they're receiving them to regulate their behaviors, and many of these children have been diagnosed uh, with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which, by the way, I'll refer to as ADD, leaving out the H sometimes. The point is that sometimes kids can be hyperactive, with attention deficit disorder and sometimes not, but ADD pretty much covers the whole syndrome with the H being understood. Now, I myself was diagnosed with this condition when I was in my early 50s, so it's something I know intimately, and uh, I have a couple of children also diagnosed with it. But despite that family history, it is my contention that contrary to standard medical thinking, Attention deficit disorder is not a genetically inherited disorder. It's something much simpler and much more complex at the same time. First of all, what is it? Well, it's a syndrome made up of a number of traits, and the traits fall into three categories. The first one is poor attention skills. Kids or adults with ADD have difficulty paying attention when they're not highly interested in something. Their minds tend to wander, there tends to be an automatic tuning out, an absence of mind, so that one has the feeling of talking to a person, but that person is somehow not there. The distractibility follows from the poor attention skills, so you begin to do something, you embark upon an intended task, and then you notice something else out of the corner of your eye, and very quickly your attention wanders to whatever you just noticed, and then so on, so pretty quickly, uh, you've forgotten what you urgently set out to do, and so tasks tend not to get completed or tend to get completed in a frustratingly slow and dilatory fashion. Uh, along with the poor attention skills, there's also forgetfulness. One tends to lose things, leave things behind, forget why one left one room to go into another. So poor attention skills is the first characteristic. The second trait is that of deficient impulse control. Impulse control means that you don't act out whatever comes into your mind. That means you don't interrupt people in conversation. You don't barge in ahead of somebody else in line. You wait your turn. When you see something that you wish to buy, uh, you may understand that you want it, but you control the impulse to spend the money that you don't have on the object. A patient once said to me, an adult who came to me for diagnosis, he said, impulse buying, he said, if I could, I would impulse buy the whole world. So poor impulse control. And I'll give you a personal example of that. When I was diagnosed, it was a typical self-diagnosis, which is to say I first learned about ADD, recognized myself and the various descriptions of it, and decided that I had it. Subsequently, I did get diagnosed by a psychiatrist and was formally assessed and treated, but I didn't wait for that. The very first day that I found out about ADD, that actually existed in adults, and, and I uh, intuited that this describes my life to a significant degree, what did I do? I'll read you from my book, Scattered Minds. The subtitle is, A New Look at the Origins and Healing of Attention Deficit Disorder. With an impatience and lack of judgment characteristic of ADD, I had already begun to self-medicate, even before the formal diagnosis. A sense of urgency typifies attention deficit disorder, a desperation to have immediately whatever it is that one may desire at the moment, be it an object, an activity, or a relationship. And there was something else here too, well expressed by a woman 
who some months later came for help. It would be nice to get a break for myself for at least a little while, she said, a sentiment I fully understood. One longs to escape the fatiguing, ever-spinning, ever-churning mind. As to what I did next, you have to understand that as a physician, I never was someone who was quick with the prescription pad. My preference was always to discuss things, to find non-pharmacological ways of dealing with things. And so people coming to me knew that they weren't in danger of immediately having thrust a, a pharmacological product into their hands. What did I do? I took Ritalin in a higher than recommended initial dose on the very first day I found out about attention deficit disorder. Within minutes, I felt euphoric and present, experienced myself as full of insight and love. My wife thought I was acting weird. You look stoned, was her immediate comment. The point being is the lack of impulse control when it comes to myself. And it's not unique to ADD. Many people lack impulse control, and certainly all the childhood disorders that we're looking at these days, the opposition to find disorder, the conduct disorders, the Asperger's, the Tourette's, and the ADD, these are all characterized by poor impulse control. In fact, as you'll hear me say later, these conditions have something uh, very uh, obvious in common. But although it's not unique to ADD, it certainly characterizes ADD, this question of poor impulse control. And these children who act out they don't do so deliberately, consciously, or with any intent to make anybody angry, upset, or anything else. They're simply exhibiting that the part of their brain, which is meant to regulate impulses, is not functioning very well. And I'll say more about that later. Now, the third characteristic, which may or may not be there, is hyperactivity of the body. These kids fidget. They move around. Right now, you'll see me sit, giving this talk in a sitting position, generally when I talk. I stand up and I walk around on stage because I'm more comfortable moving around than I am sitting still. And uh, the person with hyperactivity has difficulty sitting still. They fidget, their fingers are drumming, their thighs are pumping, their toes are tapping the ground, they're always doodling, they're just not very still. Now the child with hyperactivity, of course, is very quickly diagnosed because they create a nuisance in the classroom. The kids, and especially the girls who tend to have the inattentive type without the hyperactivity, they will not so easily be noticed. They can often go from one grade to the next, tuned out, uh, their mind elsewhere, but scraping by, not creating any problems. They just don't draw any attention, and therefore they never function as close to their potential as they could, but their problem is not obvious to anybody looking at them. Along with these primary characteristics, obviously follow some consequences, what I call secondary characteristics, disorganization, the loss of things, as I mentioned, selectively poor memory, difficulty with multiple instructions. When the ADD child is told by the teacher to first you do this, then you do that, and then thirdly, he's lost by the time he's heard the first instruction because he's struggling to remember it while he's hearing, hearing the second and the third or the fourth. I'm the same way. If I'm in the street looking for directions and I ask someone, where, say, Granville Mall is, they'll say, okay, you go to the left, you turn, and then you go two blocks, and then you see a light, and you turn right. I'm lost after the first block, and I'll have to stop again and ask for directions again. Although, of course, I won't admit that. I just pretend, and I'm nodding sagely as if I really was getting it. So difficulty with multiple instructions. Um, Again, behavior problems, because of the poor impulse control, they tend to speak out of turn. They tend to say things that are sometimes perceived as rude or hurtful. And again, it's not conscious on their part. Just the impulse regulation is not there. 